I'm Kate Seeley with the Middle East Institute, and I'm sorry to rush everybody, but this is such an important topic, and we only have an hour, well, we had an hour and a half, now we're down to about an hour and 15 minutes. Thank you for joining us for the third panel of the day. We've just come out of a very interesting lunch featuring uh, an Arab and Israeli businessman who are part of an initiative to promote uh, Arab-Israeli peace, and it's a topic that I'm sure will be touched upon in today's panel entitled In Search of Coherence in U.S. Policy in the Arab World, although it should really be called In the Middle East. It's a title that several of my friends in the State Department have strongly objected to, noting that State Department policy is is coherent, it's often the implementation of that policy that is incoherent. And it's a debate that I hope the panel will have today. Uh, Moderating today's panel is an academic who has spent a lifetime uh, writing about and researching uh, the Middle East and in the process has come to know an awful lot about uh, the region. Uh, Michael Hudson is currently uh, the director of the Middle East Institute at the National University of Singapore, no relationship to us, although we're trying to build bridges, as well as a professor of political science there. Previously, he was director of the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies at Georgetown University and remains professor emeritus there. Uh, He is published widely on the Middle East, including a seminal book on Lebanon. Michael, I want to thank you very much for joining us today, and I'd like to put the panel into your very competent hands. Thank you. Kate, thank you very much, and thanks to the Middle East Institute for organizing what uh, so far has been, I think, an exceptionally uh, uh, interesting discussion of of many uh, complicated and important issues. Uh, We're assigned to... uh, do a general kind of overview, a critical overview, I hope, of uh, the question of U.S. policy across the region, and we will not confine ourselves just to the Arab states. And let me uh, begin uh, telling you where I have come from. I have come from Singapore. Singapore uh, is the hub, or they would like to think they're the hub of almost everything uh, that's going on in this very fast-growing region of Southeast Asia, including Middle East studies, And that's why we refer to the Middle East Institute of Washington as MEI West. And we at the National University of Singapore recently uh, are trying to develop MEI East. Uh, We have a ways to go, but uh, the kind of cooperation that uh, that Kate referred to, I hope, is something that will develop into a a, a very rather more tangible uh, expression. But coming from Singapore, let me tell you a little bit about what my sense is of uh, the chattering classes, the foreign policy elites of Singapore and other places in Asia, because we we have collaborations with China and Japan and and so on. Um, Think about U.S. policy in the Middle East. Uh, Broadly speaking, it's not a flattering picture. It is not coherent. It is not successful. And there is an almost unspoken assumption that uh, the United States is in decline, particularly in this region, but perhaps generally in the world, Uh, the rate of decline being a little bit faster perhaps than some people had anticipated. The foreign minister of Turkey, uh, Ahmed Davidoglu, once said at the beginning of his tenure that he wanted to pursue a policy of no problems uh, on any border or in any area. And maybe that's what President Obama had in mind at the beginning of his first term, and especially uh, after his uh, very famous speech at Cairo University. But when we look around the region now, as I hope we will do with with a very distinguished panel, uh, it seems as if there are problems everywhere. And while we have recently heard some very optimistic words about the possibilities of Israeli-Palestinian peace, uh, about the possibility of a grand bargain between Iran and the United States, uh, about uh, the uh, problems of dealing with the uh, complications stemming from the Arab uprisings that have gone off on different trajectories. While we've uh, heard a lot about that, um, folks in Southeast Asia look, look askance at, at those who 
who insists uh, that uh, America is the indispensable nation or the, U- the U.S. has a, a certain hegemony over the Middle East uh, that it does and it should. And there's a lot of questioning about that. So what I'm going to do is uh, uh, turn this over to uh, a panel of very well-known uh, uh, commentators on the Middle East as a region in general and also on certain particular areas of it. Uh, I won't introduce them at length uh, except to uh, because they're well described in your program, but it's, it's very good, I think, that we've, we have uh, Rula Khalif from the Financial Times, Aaron Miller from the Woodrow Wilson Center, uh, a man with long experience in, in U.S. Middle East diplomacy, uh, Fred Hoff from the Hariri Center at the Atlantic Council, and Stephen Simon uh, is there. He's here. Welcome. And Stephen Simon from the IISS, which is not to be confused with the ISIS, <laughs> and, and I think will, will not be. Um, uh, and I'm going to uh, simply go down the, the row here at the beginning and uh, ask my colleagues to uh, comment on this notion that uh, the United States is, is in a significant decline in the Middle East. Is that true? And if it is true, is it a bad thing or a, or a good thing? And I'll start uh, with Rula Khalif. Uh, people will talk about that, and they'll talk about anything else they want to. And I know that uh, Aaron... Uh, uh, has a few things he wants to get out on the table right away about the uh, nature of decision-making in Washington uh, with respect to the Middle East. But we'll start, first of all, uh, with uh, Rula Khalaf from the Financial Times. Thank you, Michael. Is this working? You're on. Yeah. Yeah. I think decline is a, is a loaded word. Um, I thought I'd make four, four observations The first is that the U.S., to my mind, is in a sort of deliberate retreat. And when you become very hesitant about your intentions and your policies, then inevitably you end up with less leverage. And I think what we do see in the region right now is that the U.S. does have less leverage, and that has opened up... Uh, the space for others, for more regional players to have more leverage for the Saudis, the Qataris, the Turks. Um, my second point is that we are, th- this is a region right now in which almost every single country is in some form of crisis, which is truly un- unprecedented. Traditionally, we've had, you know, two running crises and maybe another country that's uh, exploding for one reason or another. But today, every single country has to deal with an internal problem, some of it very violent, some of it not, not as much. And I think that makes it very difficult for any outsider, whether it's the U.S. or any other power, um, to address such fast-changing circumstances. And so policy becomes very reactive rather than being strategic. And we saw that in Egypt, the hesitancy, the, you know, one day we, the U.S. seems to be on the side of the Islamists, the next day it seems to be on the side of, of the military. So my third point is that as a result of all this, we are now in a situation where virtually every constituency in, in the Middle East is alienated. Um, and therefore, uh, and blames the U.S., whether it's the Islamists or the liberals in Egypt, um, the rebels in Syria and the regime, in fact, more recently, the Palestinians and the Israelis. So n- nobody is satisfied, and everyone seems to blame the, U- the U.S. policy for that. And my fourth point is that what we've seen over the past three years in the Middle East is an existential crisis for many countries, Um, countries in the Gulf in particular that were afraid that this wave of uprisings, of popular movements, would reach them. And therefore, the counter-revolutionary forces have been very, very forceful 
uh, and unusually forceful in many instances. And that has led to a divergence of interests between traditional allies of the U.S. and, and um, the administration. Uh, the Saudis, for instance, drew the line in, in Bahrain. Uh, whatever, whatever the U.S. said, they weren't going, they simply weren't going to take it. And I think in a similar way, um, they, they simply said, hand, you know, either back, uh, the, the latest coup in Egypt or keep your hands off. So the, the, these changes that we're seeing don't allow for the traditional alliances to work in the way that they used to work. Having said all of that, I think the, the greatest irony in the Middle East, and it's always been so, is that while people complain about U.S. policy, while people feel alienated by U.S. policies, everyone does still seem to look to the U.S. for solutions. Uh, it used to be a decade ago that... Uh, the alienation was due to not wanting the U.S. to intervene. Today, actually, a lot of, uh, a lot of the anger that we see is because the U.S. is not intervening. You know, um, we've heard a lot this morning to back up that comment. People seem to be asking or expecting the United States to do something, and yet the question of declining leverage is pretty, is pretty uh, evident. If the U.S. decides not to send another carrier group to the Gulf, or if the U.S. Uh, seems to falter or stumble on the question of the Syrian opposition, uh, if the U.S. seems to uh, find itself pushed aside by the Russians of all people, remember them uh, who have come back uh, and seem at the moment at least to be taking the lead you know, in a certain diplomatic uh, course, that's a problem. And you're quite right. I, I've heard this because we travel a lot in the Gulf, that there is a, a, a apprehension that, you know, where is the United States? And is it a question of a lack of capability of hard power, or is it, in addition, perhaps, a lack of will and certainly perhaps a decline of soft power? But I'll let, let me turn now to uh, Aaron, and we'll, we'll continue on. Michael, thank you. And really, those are... Those were terrific comments. My own view on these matters is somewhat um, different and counterintuitive. I mean, to talk about cohesion in U.S. foreign policy assumes that that's been the standard method by which the United States has operated. I, I would argue that it is in the job description of great powers, and however much we may be in decline, and we can talk about that in a minute, life is relative. Um, we are, in my judgment, not, not in decline uh, so much as um, we have made a set of decisions um, based on a, a president's priorities about what to do and what not to do. And we always talk about U.S. policy. We always focus on the substance. We don't talk about the politics and the priorities of presidents. The appropriate place to begin to understand American policy is not in the region. It's in Washington. And I would argue for at least three reasons – you have a different style of operation. Number one, you have a president who envisioned himself as a transformative political figure when he came to office. Transformative by, by literally by who he was, literally by who he was, historic, a historic president by any standard, but a president who inherited the arguably the two longest and among the, the least profitable wars in American history and the greatest uh, economic crisis since the Great Depression. These were transformative experiences, and he believed – he could fundamentally transform them and American politics. He also believed that he could, he could be transformative abroad. He got the Nobel Peace Prize on the part of Europeans, the Swedes and the Norwegians, but it reflected a tendency in Europe and in the Middle East to believe that Barack Obama would be fundamentally different than all of his predecessors. This was a fundamental mistake because what happened is a transformational president with transformational objectives, soon understood that he was faced with an environment that if he was lucky, both at home and abroad, he'd be able not to transform at all, but to transact. And that's exactly what he has become. He has become a transactional president with lowered objectives and a set of priorities, frankly, that are focused much more on the middle class than they are in the Middle East. And this is something that escapes most people, as if Barack Obama should, 
at a time when America's house is broken, at a time when it is in arguably dysfunctional, I call them the five or six deadly Ds, debt, deficit, dysfunctional politics, deteriorating educational system, <clears throat> deteriorating infrastructure, dependence on hydrocarbons, chasing around the world trying to repair other people's broken houses without first or at the same time attending to America's own difficulties, no longer was sustainable among the political elites, with some exception, and the country as a whole. So he's made choices. That's my first comment. And those choices are risk-averse, except when it comes to what we could generally describe as the national security arena, where he has been eminently risk-ready, and frankly, he has evolved to be a, a much more disciplined less reckless, I would argue, without being pejorative, version of his predecessor. That's set of comments number one. Number two, I know you'll, you'll find it shocking and stunning to the, to the point of not being credible, but I would argue to you that on the four or five core interests that represent what Obama believes to be American interests in the Middle East, we are actually not doing badly. Number one, he's prevented another attack on the, against the continental United States, the organizing principle of any nation's foreign policy. You cannot protect your homeland. You don't need a foreign policy. Number two, we have an energy revolution in North America. We are weaning ourselves from Arab hydrocarbons. It doesn't solve the energy security problem. And since oil trades in a single market, disruption in country X means potential complications for American economy and financial markets, too. Number three, we are getting out of the two, among the two most profitless wars in American history, where the standard for victory was never could we win, but when could we leave. And extrication is no metric by which to judge the performance of the still most consequential country in the, in, in the world. It has implications for the president's decision-making with respect to Syria, you've already seen it, and with respect to Iran. And finally, we are involved for the first time, it may work, it may not, in an effort to prevent the Iranians from acquiring a nuclear weapons capacity through sanctions, through diplomacy, and arguably through the threat of force. Those, I would argue, are core and vital American interests. The remaining two interests, I argue, are discretionary, not because they're not important, but because our capacity to resolve them is limited. One is how we deal with what Rula rightly described as a fundamental transformation in a region in which there are now so many moving parts that I would challenge any great power to create a policy that had cohesion and continuity right now. And second, the Arab-Israeli issue, where I spent most of my professional life, at least in government. These are not vital in the sense that we, what we do and what we don't do are important, but they aren't determinative. And that makes pursuing these interests a much more complex uh, proposition for the United States. Well, okay. <clears throat> Dig, we're digging ourselves out of two holes in Afghanistan and Iraq, that's uh, something. Fracking is something that happened, uh, not exactly Obama's uh, decision. Um, saving us, saving the homeland from terrorist attack, well, they, it hasn't happened. Um, why has it not happened? That's, a, that's you know, a, a broader question. And on these discretionary matters, I think I would agree with you that, that it would be very difficult if you put yourself in Obama's position to imagine a consistent policy when Arab uprisings have taken so many different courses in so many different places. But nevertheless, one wonders where exactly were we on Egypt and Libya? And Syria, where suddenly we got diverted into a chemical weapons issue, which is nice in itself, but sort of sidestepped major issues and so on. 
And on Arab-Israeli matters, we've just heard a most eloquent and highly optimistic presentation at lunch, but uh, the consensus, maybe maybe academics are just too skeptical or maybe you, you know, we've been studying it too long, is that to get to a meaningful two-state solution uh, is not going to be so easy, even though the Secretary of State seems to be throwing himself into this uh, you know, with, with genuine enthusiasm. But we can come back to all these things, and after uh, our other two colleagues have made general comments, uh, I hope we can perhaps zero in on some of these more specific issues and then, of course, open it up for your comments and questions toward the end. But let me turn uh, now to uh, Ambassador Hoff. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael. I think my, uh, I think my colleagues have, uh, have bracketed the issue rather well. Uh, now, if you are inclined, as I am, uh, to believe that the United States is indeed uh, the indispensable nature, uh, nation when it comes to uh, confronting threats to the peace around the world, when it comes to trying, trying as best we can, given all our constraints, to shape uh, geopolitical uh, developments, then I think there's a natural uh, inclination uh, to resist the proposition uh, that what we're seeing in the Middle East is a permanent diminution uh, of American power and influence. Uh, what's beyond dispute, though, at least in the context of Syria, uh, where I'm spending a lot of my, uh, a lot of my time uh, concentrating, uh, is that allies and friends of the United States uh, do indeed see us as rudderless and directionless. Uh, this, is, this is simply beyond dispute, at least in terms of what their perception is. Uh, they see an administration. I think they'd agree entirely with, Al, with Aaron. They see an administration and a president whose interests and priorities are entirely elsewhere. And they get it. Uh, they understand fully uh, that at least one reason for the president's reluctance to invest more time and effort in Syria than in the region generally has been his priority on domestic uh, priority, his, his priori priority on domestic issues. And uh, they, they even get it in terms of uh, the president having to make sure, for example, that the, uh, that the rollout of the uh, Affordable Health Care Act uh, would have to be flawless. I think we're dealing not so much with a permanent decline as we are a temporary distraction. Uh, it's understandable to me, and it's even defensible, uh, that President Obama would want what he considers to be uh, the poison chalice of Syria to pass his lips. Uh, no doubt the full recovery of our economy is what he wants to focus on. Uh, no doubt he sees the, uh, the long-term interests of American security and the American economy more bound up in East Asia Pacific uh, than he does in our favorite part of the world. Uh, he has a good argument to make, I think, on both counts. But the ability of presidents to pick and choose priorities is not without limit. Korea is not where Harry Truman thought he would be focusing the bulk of his time uh, from June 1950 right through January 1953. Uh, we're faced now with the Middle East where, where fundamental questions of political legitimacy stemming from the age-old problem of what follows the Ottoman Empire. Uh, these questions are being addressed. Uh, we're facing a situation in <coughs> Syria where a country is being informally partitioned by a long-term state sponsor of terror and terror itself. So I don't think we're looking at decline, and I, I do not see what I consider to be the mishandling of the Syria situation as necessarily having implications for American commitments to peace and stability 
elsewhere in the world. Uh, but I think the distraction is real. And the manner in which we interact with friends and allies, at least for them, is a real issue. You know, I, I met a Chinese analyst uh, from a think tank in Shanghai not long ago, <clears throat> and he said, you know, <clears throat> we were watching very carefully to see if the U.S. was going to use force in Syria. And uh, when we noticed that the U.S. didn't, he thinks the Chinese leadership then thought, well, we can be a little bit more pushy in the East China and South China seas. And that says something not just about the Middle East, but also about the famous pivot, which is regarded, I think, in some quarters in, the, in, in Southeast Asia, at least, with some skepticism. I heard an Indian analyst at a conference in Singapore not long ago saying, well, 1,500 Marines to Darwin? That's laughable. Four littoral landing craft to Singapore? Well, yes, but you know, from their point of view, the, the country to watch is China, which is cleverly free-riding on the United States and the Middle East and letting their sometime colleagues, the Russians, you know, do, the, do the pushing in that part of the world. So I agree with you, and I think it, it is indeed a poison chalice that, that Obama was right not to uh, sip from. But there are repercussions, and whether it's just a, uh, you know, a uh, temporary diversion or something more serious, I think, still needs to be debated. Uh, Stephen Simon is our, is our fourth uh, panelist, and uh, I turn the microphone to him. Thank you, Michael. Um, now that uh, Rula and Aaron have bracketed the topic and Fred has staked out the middle ground, I think I'll – perhaps I'll say a few words about the monetization of European debt. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, really. Um, uh, I'll make a few cats and dogs uh, observations just maybe to round out the discussion um, a little bit. I mean, one, one thing that I found curious about the way the issue was framed was the emphasis on, on decline and um, how that reminded me of previous bouts of declinism, uh, even, you know, within my own career in, in Washington. Uh, but certainly there have been bouts of it uh, before. Uh, I mean, within recent memory, uh, you know, Japan looked like it was ascendant and the United States was going down the tubes. Um, uh, the U.S. Uh, deployed forces to Lebanon. Uh, they got attacked by uh, uh, Hezbollah and, um, you know, the United States turned tail and ran. Uh, there was Vietnam, of course, a tremendous defeat, 57,000 killed. Uh, somehow the United States managed to um, uh, climb up out of that pit and uh, within a few years was crushing uh, the Soviet Union um, uh, and en route to an end of the Cold War. Um, you know, you look at uh, the failure, uh, if I can put it that way, of the U.S. to roll back communism uh, from Eastern Europe in the late 40s, 50s, and 60s. Um, was that a function of declinism or was that a function of mature risk assessment? Um, uh, you know, uh, you, uh, you decide. The other uh, thing about um, decline that got me thinking, I guess, um, uh, so it was, I suppose it was worthwhile uh, in that respect to frame the issue uh, in those terms, was to ask myself, um, what the U.S. would have been doing differently over the past few years if it had been ascendant as against a, a declining power? Uh, and the answers just really weren't um, clear to me. I mean, if the United States uh, had not been in a decline, uh, you know, arguably um, uh, speaking, would the United States have um, uh, somehow kept Mubarak in power? Or alternatively, would it have uh, rolled back the coup that ejected uh, Morsi uh, from power? Um, uh, would the United States have somehow forced uh, Israel to do a deal with the Palestinians or the Palestinians to do a deal with Israel or what have you? Um, would the U.S. Uh, actually have used force against uh, Syria? Would the U.S. have assessed that as um, uh, the strategically sensible uh, thing to do. So uh, 
trying to distinguish between whether the United States does something out of weakness or it does something out of uh, an intelligence selection of choices based on uh, an assessment of risks and opportunities is something perhaps, you know, we do want to um, uh, talk about. Uh, my, my own sense, uh, which is Aaron's, I guess, as well, and even Fred was, uh, I think, on this uh, um, on this page is that uh, it, these have been deliberate choices that have not been made uh, necessarily because of uh, a sense of, I don't know, defeatism or uh, uh, an instinct for preemptive capitulation born of a sense of uh, weakness. Now, having said all that, uh, it's not as though uh, the U.S. Um, uh, has a lot of cards to play at the moment, and that's uh, partly owing to the wars that we fought. There's a paper that just came out. I'm sorry about that. There's a paper that just came out um, from Harvard by Linda Bilmes, who's the economist uh, who co-authored the book with Joe Stiglitz about the cost of the uh, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan wars, which uh, observes uh, or calculates, really, that the cost of the wars was somewhere between four and six uh, trillion dollars. Uh, this is really a lot of money, and what what makes it really, really a lot of money is that the entire amount was borrowed, uh, and we've been servicing the debt on that from the moment the first supplemental appropriation uh, was made and the money uh, borrowed to back it um, uh, in 2002. So um, uh, this is quite a bill, and it's going to necessarily confine uh, America's flexibility, particularly in the Middle East, where money uh, is important and the use of force has been um, uh, a characteristic of American foreign policy responses uh, to challenges uh, in that region. So um, it's, it, it, this isn't to say we're in decline, uh, but it's to say that there are constraints that any administration, regardless of party, will have to contend with. And then just two other thoughts um, uh, which relate to the uh, underlying premise uh, uh, of this panel. The one on coherence uh, is that um, it, you can't expect, it seems to me, um, a country like the United States with, with very diverse interests in a region that uh, I, uh, one of my co-panelists has just said uh, had a lot of moving parts, and owing to the Arab Spring was extremely dynamic right now. Uh, it's unrealistic to expect uh, a quote-unquote coherent response. I mean, we want democracy in Egypt, but we also want to see Arab-Israeli peace. Well, uh, it's going to be a lot harder to get uh, Palestinian-Israeli um, uh, peace accords if we have turned our back on Egypt. It's just going to be harder. Um, now, these are two legitimate objectives. They happen to clash, and they're going to produce what some might uh, regard as an incoherent uh, poly policy response. Lastly, on the question of credibility, um, I just note um, this is a, you know, a bit academic, and I'm not even an academic, so perhaps I shouldn't be treading um, uh, uh, in, in these uh, uh, deep waters. But um, it looks to scholars who now have had access uh, to the archives of the Soviet Union and Warsaw Pact countries that um, crisis response um, uh, on the part of parties uh, you know, uh, involved in a crisis generally doesn't um, – relate to reputational issues. So in other words, um, uh, one country will not respond in a crisis to another country's moves on the basis of what that second country had done 10 years before uh, in circumstances that were not exactly similar. Um, that countries in a crisis tend to look at their adversary um, uh, through a contemporary lens, uh, asking themselves, what is at stake for my adversary right now, and what is my adversary's capacity to defend his interest? So, you know, I'm not all that worried. Um, perhaps I should be, but I'm not all that worried about, um, you know, analysts in Singapore who look at the U.S. response to Syria and wonder uh, whether the Chinese are going to come and devour them. 
um, because the Chinese are no longer afraid of the United States. If there ever is a confrontation between the United States and China in the South China Sea or wherever, I'm sure uh, the parties will decide how it is they want to deal with that confrontation on the basis of their assessment at that moment of the stakes involved for each party and the capacity they have to defend them. Thanks. Well, speaking of <clears throat> treading in, in deep academic waters, let me, let me ask you to put on your professorial hats and give a grade, uh, give a grade to uh, recent U.S. Middle East policy, considering that uh, they don't like us very much in Egypt, whether they're in the government or the opposition. They're mad at us in Saudi Arabia and the Gulf. Uh, uh, in Iraq, they might like to see more of us, but Iraq is a mess that we've been trying to get out of. Uh, in Israel, it's possible that a right-wing government thinks, well, you know, the, this administration is so weak it can't possibly exert pressure if, if pressure, in fact, is called for to advance negotiations, uh, and so on and so forth. And I don't know, um, I, I would... I would give them about a C, I guess, but I, I don't know whether Rulla and I, I think there's some differences of opinion among us here on this panel as to. I, I don't think you can give a great all. Uh, I, I don't think all the crisis can be dealt with in the same way. Nor do I think that uh, the administration could have. The, there are issues that it could not have done anything about. Um, I think Syria and Egypt in particular, there could have been early action and more coherence. I think on Iran, the, administ the administration is doing exactly what it should be doing on Israel-Palestine as well. So I don't think that one can take a, you know, just a blanket view of, um, of this administration, Middle Eastern policies. On Syria, I think it was a missed opportunity, arming the rebels early on. I think could have made a difference. I'm not saying it would have made a difference for sure, but I think the chances of it making a difference, tipping the balance just enough to get the two sides to the negotiating table, I think that was worth taking the risk for. And the administration ended up doing it and not doing it at the same time, but when it was too late. And I think on Egypt, not taking – I know why the administration didn't take a position on, um, on the coup – um, but I think that what transpired then was one day it seemed to be on one side and the next day on the other. So while the impact of its policies in Egypt may not have made a difference, I think it would a bit more clarity um, could have created more leverage because I think the military in Egypt called the administration's bluff. You know, it's great powers. We, we are a great power. We have a better distribution of power, uh, economic, military, political soft power, than any other single country in the international system. And we're likely to maintain that distribution, favorable distribution of power for many years to come. The sources of anger toward the United States in this region run deep. And frankly, Michael, you know as well as I, perhaps better, that they long predated this notion that the President of the United States has been in an unfortunate choice of words by someone, I'm sure that they regret now, leading from behind. Sources of anger run deep. In large part, they're emblematic are the two special relationships that the United States first maintained in this region from the 1940s. Those special relationships are now not in crisis, but both the Israelis and the Saudis the two, are two special relationships are angry at us, uh, but nonetheless, um, the, the, those, those sources are, are perceived unlimited support for Israel, our support for authoritarian, um, the kings, which paradoxically in this age of disappointment over democracy, transparency, and gender equality, it's the kings, ironically, that have fared better than the faux republics, and it's the kings on whom we are Depending, the kings may, the bell may toll for them too at some point, but not for quite a while, I suspect. 
So, you know, what is it? What is our job? Our job is to be, as a great power, I suspect, is to be admired, feared, respected, but never loved. I mean, the great power will never be loved. And given our relationships in this region, I'll just use two. Our special relationship with the state of Israel, which is only getting more special, despite the tensions that exist between probably the the most dysfunctional relationship between an Israeli prime minister and an American president that that I've seen, Uh, and our relationship with Saudi Arabia, unlike Lehman Brothers, too big, truly, these two relationships are probably too big to fail. So I don't, I mean, I, 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 Steve and, and Fred, and to a lesser extent, Rula, have identified the fact that this is not necessarily, this state is not necessarily a permanent state with respect to American interests and influence in this region. What is idiosyncratic is the region itself and the challenges that it is offering up for, for any power. And I'll return to the theme that I suggested at the beginning. We're not winning, but on what matters to the United States and the things we can do something about, I actually don't think we're doing badly, however much we are not admired, not respected, and not feared. Okay. Fred? Well, since, uh, since the professor asked for the grade, uh, I'll give one, at least in the, uh, in the context of, uh, of Syria. And it, uh, it happens purely coincidentally to be, a, to be a grade I was quite accustomed to uh, as a... <laughs> As an undergraduate, and that would be a, a D plus. Uh, my uh, my my criticism my criticism has has more to do with methodology uh, than anything else. And I agree entirely with Aaron uh, that if you're uh, you know if you're looking for total coherence, uh, the foreign policy of a of a great power is uh, is not the place to. Uh, put your magnifying glass. Uh, Nevertheless, uh, from the very beginning, in my view, uh, this administration has resisted any notion of trying to systematically define objectives and set a strategy with regard to Syria. And it's all understandable I mean, look, and there are, there are, you know, we can we can argue endlessly over over specific steps. I agree entirely on the point of uh, arming the opposition early, but but these things are debatable. What's what's not debatable, I think, is the way business should be done. Even if we're not going to achieve 100 percent coherence, should we at least try for some of it? At the beginning, the guiding assumption for a great many people, quite frankly, was that Bashar al-Assad was toast, that he was going to be gone, it was going to be sooner rather than later. Much of the debate in the summer of 2011 over whether or not the President of the United States should tell the Syrian President to step aside was driven by this idea that Assad's going to be going quickly, this is irresistible, and we'd better put together a proper presidential send-off and in the process get our guy on the right side of history. Okay? Not much thought given to what's, what's the strategy to make it happen. President of the United States in cases like this is not issuing advisory opinions. He's not, he's not a lieutenant at the officers club, Friday night happy hour, just, just giving his views about what ought to be happening out there. Later, when it became clear that Assad was going nowhere fast, largely a function, of his ability to harness certain sectarian trends inside of Syria, largely a function of the help he was getting from uh, Iran and Russia in particular. Then it became a matter of not really 
wanting to have a systematic interagency review process on this because it was known there were certain places the president really didn't want to go. All right? Look, every president has his own style on how he wants to handle the national, national security system. But in this case, in my view, it just hasn't worked. It's been entirely reactive in nature. Uh, there's been an unnatural reliance on what uh, people in the White House call strategic communications uh, to try to explain all of this. Uh, hence my grade, D+. Plus. Okay. And, and Steve? Um, I don't know. I guess, uh, you know, I give the administration a fairly good grade. Um, you know, primarily looking at uh, results and not so much as process, which is inevitably a black box, um, you know, to those uh, outside of it. You know, there's, uh, you, well, uh, you just go down the, go down the list, I mean, very briefly, telegraphically. Um, uh, Iran uh, looks like a deal is, uh, is within reach to uh, get a six-month suspension of their nuclear program while further talks go on for something, um, uh, you know, more long-term. This is going to have an effect on breakout lead times um, and diminish tensions. Uh, certainly that can't be a bad thing. Uh, uh, Syria is disarmed of its chemical weapons. I just saw a news squib the other day saying that Israel was ending its, pro its distribution program for gas masks to the public, um, a, a major advance in regional security. Um, uh, in Egypt, I'm not really sure, uh, and perhaps we can talk about this, I'm not really sure what the United States uh, was, you know, was or could be um, uh, was expected to do or, or could be expected to do, but in any case, um, uh, although it's been uh, messy, bloody, and awful, at least the place is not coming apart right now, um, uh, which is something uh, deeply to be uh, thankful for. Um, uh, Jordan uh, is hanging in there with a, a very um, a significant influx of U.S. aid um, uh, to, to that kingdom. Uh, in the face of the serious pressures it's, it's um, experiencing. And if you look at the Gulf, um, uh, you know, they seem to me to be doing quite, quite well. I mean, the Saudis uh, have uh, over $800 billion, uh, in in the bank. Uh, the Kuwaitis probably have, um, uh, you know, something nearing uh, that figure. Uh, reserves, uh, I think, are quite healthy. Oil prices are uh, also hanging in there. I don't see any prospect for a sudden uh, dive in them that would be destabilizing politically, socially, uh, economically. So, um, you know, uh, really uh, uh, nothing to dislike there, and there's no threat to U.S. base access uh, or defense cooperation agreements uh, remain, uh, you know, in force. Uh, you know, fully observed and, and useful. We have a fair amount of uh, forces out there now, and of course, the forward headquarters of a major command. Um, uh, you know, no no real threat to that. It seems to me, um, Syria, uh, as as Fred has observed, uh, is um, uh, is a horrible horrible uh, problem. How the U.S. can solve that problem is, is not, um, you know, altogether clear to me apart from some of these arms control things that we've just, um, that we've just talked about. But just, um, you know, on that Syria question, uh, one of the things that's hampered the debate, it seems to me, um, and maybe both within government but also outside of it, is um, uh, some, uh, you know, reasonable consensus based on, um, you know, a convincing corpus of evidence uh, of the costs of inaction. Because I think people understand or they have um, 
uh, an instinctive grasp of what the costs of action are, especially looking at the two wars that the United States has fought. But defining the costs of inaction is very, very difficult. So if you're a policymaker and you're trying to decide, well, what to do, should I get involved in here or not, and you're comparing um, something unknown, namely the cost of inaction, against what you presume to be very large on the basis of evidence, namely the cost of action, you're, you're probably going to opt not to get not to get in there. And unless, um, uh, you know, there's a consensus on the cost of inaction that's really convincing and that you have a cabinet that can really make that case, uh, I think it's, uh, it's quite difficult uh, to get a positive um, uh, response. And then, uh, you know, just to wrap up, uh, Iraq, um, uh, you know, kind of a, kind of a mess, but uh, uh, Nouri al-Maliki has a nearly a million-man uh, army uh, you know, he can protect what's, uh, what's important to him. I don't see a disintegration, um, uh, really, of the Iraqi state. So, um, you know, that's kind of a banal tour de raison, but it's, uh, it's, it's the situation. So uh, if, that's, uh, if you agree um, with these characterizations, I think you'd have to agree that uh, the administration, um, uh, for all uh, the doubts about the policy process that Fred has raised, um, uh, has done okay. Okay. Well, I don't think the uh, the assembled professors here all agree on what the final grade should be, but that's that's uh, fine, and that's as it should be. Uh, the management uh, happily has given us a little extra time so that we can have some comments and questions from the office, from the from the uh, audience. Let me just say uh, one thing. Going back to a point, I think an important point that Aaron made at the beginning. Uh, it may be that as you try to assess U.S. Middle East policy, uh, you you indeed cannot look just at the Middle East itself. You have to look back here at home. And I would be interested if, if, it, if this should come up in any of the comments uh, or questions whether uh, our panelists might have an opinion as to whether the domestic factors uh, affecting President Obama uh, uh, significantly uh, uh, affect the possibilities for uh, American action. At any rate, uh, I think uh, it's time now to open up uh, the conversation to, uh, to everybody in the audience. And if you have comments or questions, uh, please uh, rise and approach one of the microphones. And if you would identify yourself and then uh, make your comment or question as concise as possible, we would appreciate it. Yes, please. Uh, Peter Humphrey, Intel Analyst. Um, McCain says, at a minimum, a bare minimum, crater the runways to massively lower the death toll from the sky. I mean, really? Really, can't you just do that? That one thing? Or rather than let this hemorrhage go on and on and on? You just do that one damn thing. I think that's yours. Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, I think that during the uh, during the limited period of time uh, when American military strikes uh, were actually uh, under active consideration, right after the uh, August twenty first chemical incident, my suspicion. And it's only that, it's a suspicion, uh, is that where we might well have focused would have been on airfields, it would have been on aircraft, it would have been art on artillery in the open, it would have been on Scud missiles, and it would have been on rockets. It would have been on the, basically, the delivery systems and their support systems. Uh, all associated uh, with a regime policy of mass terror. Uh, the deliberate targeting of residential areas which for one reason or another, it has de they've declined to occupy them or they're unable to occupy them on the ground. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, this is the administration's real dilemma here. Uh, because in the wake of that incident, in the wake of the, uh, the chemical weapons framework agreement, and I, I agree entirely with Steve, in and of itself it's a good 
thing. You know, Bashar al-Assad and company stripped of chemical weapons, not a thing wrong with that for 23 million Syrians and for the neighborhood. Iran can return the entire capacity 10 years ago. My, my, my point, I think, is that uh, a very small percentage of those Syrians, and we're talking about civilians, uh, killed by the regime, have been killed by chemical weapons extraordinarily small percentage. And now the regime is fully back in business, uh, slaughtering people, just taking care to make sure they're not doing it with chemical weapons. So I think that's why we're seeing the scramble uh, for a Geneva conference. The problem there is uh, Secretary of State Kerry wants us to focus on the political transition of Assad and company that is indeed the objective of the Geneva process. Uh, but Assad and company have been winning a string of battles on the ground. Uh, they think they're winning overall, and uh, they're in no mood to be transitioned. Can I, can I offer yes. one additional okay. point here? Go ahead. I don't think this is a matter – watching the president's behavior over the last several years, I don't think this is a matter of a specific military tactic. I think it is – it, it, it stems from a willful, I would argue wise, Fred and I have argued about this repeatedly, a willful and wise view drawn from the shadows of Iraq and Afghanistan that loom large. And let me make clear, no one is talking about the deployment of thousands or hundreds of thousands of American forces on the ground in Syria. That is not the analogy. That's a false analogy. The proper analogy to draw from the two longest and among the least profitable wars in American history, where 6,000-plus Americans have died, thousands more have received life-crippling injuries, trillions of dollars expended, and the answer is, for what? For what? The proper analogy to draw is, what is the relationship between the application of American military power, even your tactical suggestion of cratering runways and the end state. That is the critical question that any White House needs to ask and answer. What is the purpose of American military action and what are the consequences for the United States of militarizing its role in this conflict? That question, I believe, has, was asked repeatedly. I think no one came up with a compelling answer as to why this wouldn't create additional risks, consequences, and ultimately could involve the United States getting stuck with the check for Syria. And I think this has been a decision that the President has willfully made again and again and again. And I suspect, barring some event I cannot even divine, he will continue to look for ways to avoid involvement there. Okay. Uh, yes, please. Would yes. you identify yourself? Uh, Yvonne Pliss, MEI. I was just wondering, we haven't heard too terribly much about uh, the recent round of negotiations with Iran. And I was wondering, given what we do and don't know, if we could sort of speak to that situation, especially um, if Saudi Arabia feels threatened by that and sort of what the calculus there is. Would you like to respond sure. to that? Yeah. An Israeli official said recently that the Saudis, uh, that Israel is saying what the Saudis won't say in public. I think the, the position of Saudi Arabia today towards these talks is quite similar in that the concern is that if uh, you end up with a deal that is not watertight, that, um, in fact, the role of Iran, and you have to remember that for the Gulf, for the Sunni Gulf states, it is not just, their concern about Iran is not limited only to the nuclear program. It is about Iranian influence in the region. And I think the concern is that um, a deal that allows Iran wiggle room uh, will end up legitimizing Iran's role in the region and undermining their own. 
Um, I think that these fears are uh, overblown and that the Gulf states are still unable to um, envisage a, a different security relationship in the Gulf. Um, I think they're stuck in the, um, in the rivalry, in the very traditional power struggle. And I think that if a deal is reached with Iran, it opens up a lot of possibilities for a completely different security framework in, in the region that could, in fact, benefit them. And a change of behavior in the Iranian uh, regime does have a lot of benefits to, um, to the Gulf states, whether it's in Lebanon, in Syria, uh, or in, in Bahrain. But, Rola, do you, do you think that the near miss of the recent talks has opened up so many opportunities for those that are against some kind of an arrangement between the U.S. and Iran on the nuclear and maybe other things that, that uh, this possibility for an ultimate, not a rapprochement, but a sort of an, a deal is scuttled? Because you have hardliners in Iran, you have hardliners in the region, and you certainly have hardliners here in, in the United States well, that matters, see an opportunity yeah. now to... Well, what matters immediately, I suppose, is, is mainly Congress. And we've seen all this week the debate in Congress. There's a lot of opposition uh, to this deal. Uh, but I'm not sure that, if, that there's enough time for um, momentum to, to, to be as uh, so strong that it uh, derails the deal. There, there are meetings next week. I think, you know, what we hear is that there is, there's still a good chance that something will be, will be achieved. And then I think if, if the administration can, can show something credible, um, I think the president knows that public opinion will be on his side. And I think that could potentially change the dynamics in, in, in Congress. I'm just going to add something. Would you like to add something? Yes, please. Just said, yeah. Which is the interesting <clears throat> thing about this is what it shows about the lack of leverage that others have on an issue that's of strategic importance to the United States. Yes, please. Hi, I'm, I'm Matt Spitalnik uh, with Reuters News Service, a White House correspondent. Um, I know a lot of these folks, and I do appreciate you doing this. Um, again, staying on Iran, um, you know, given, again, the vociferous complaints from Israel and from Saudi Arabia uh, and apparent divisions also even within, within the P5 plus one, how well or badly do you see, uh, uh, is the administration handling uh, the talks with Iran? And what, what could go wrong if this diplomatic track fails? What are the risks? Who would like to t take that one? Any takers? Uh, uh, well, a lot of things could, could go wrong. Um, plenty of uh, opportunity for slip between cup and lip on, on this one, obviously. But uh, I think the main contours uh, had already been worked uh, well before the first five plus one meeting, the first of the two that have taken place uh, thus far. Um, uh, so I don't think that there was a great deal of sticker shock on the Iranian side. And... Um, uh, U.S. allies um, certainly you know, had been briefed on the contours of the deal, you know, beforehand. Um, the the U.S. has been doing hand-holding uh, on this for years now, and the president, uh, in in this regard, has gone very far out on a limb in uh, positing the use of military force to prevent Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon. That's what he said on a number of occasions publicly, um, uh, that's quite an audacious claim, and it was intended to be reassuring, particularly to the Israelis, but possibly also um, uh, to the Saudis. So uh, that kind of handholding will continue. Now, the anxiety um, of, the, of the Israelis and the Saudis in, in, in particular is riding very high. I mean, that's pretty pretty obvious, I think, you know, for the Saudis, but also to some extent for the, um, uh, for the Israelis, there's an underlying concern, and that concern is about the withdrawal of the United States from the region, a kind of a retrenchment. And there's a sense that um, uh, the eagerness or apparent eagerness to do a deal with Iran is intended to pave the way 
for a withdrawal that would not only leave our allies exposed, but also create opportunities for Iranian uh, uh, aggrandizement in the region. And in fact, in the darkest version uh, of, this, uh, of this narrative, uh, in the deepest, most fevered dreams, um, uh, there's a, an unspoken side agreement to clear the market uh, with the Iranians, whereby uh, Iran would uh, be given um, carte blanche to do what it wishes in the region, uh, so long as it agreed to this nuclear deal um, in a five plus one context. And in that in that bigger framework. Um, Iran, uh, this, the Syria situation fits in quite nicely because it looks as though the West is, is walking away from Syria in a way that enables Iran to maintain its prerogatives there. So, um, you know, you have uh, an understanding of the situation that contributes, I think, um, uh, you know, pretty understandably to uh, a high level of anxiety, and, and that will be difficult to, to quell, I think. Can I just add one? It, it, it's fascinating because I can't prove this. There's no empirical evidence to validate it. But I, I cannot uh, but believe that one of the reasons the president uh, willfully steered clear of military intervention in Syria was because he knows that the, the grander prize here is a deal with the Iranians on the nuclear issue. And a military intervention could result in two Consequences: One, a proxy war um, with the Iranians. And second, even the possibility of killing or wounding Iranians on the ground. And I think he, his calculation was he cannot, he would not get the Russians also to agree to both a deal on Syria, comprehensive deal on Syria and Iran. And I, and I think this just validates <clears throat> the, the Israeli concern. What, one additional point. Any agreement that doesn't get to an end state to allay concerns of allies and offers up as its best notional objective putting time back on the clock is going to be perceived as a imperfect agreement. Because let's be clear. That's the objective here. Even the end state agreement, and who knows in what form it will take, the objective here is not once scientific knowledge enters the consciousness of a society, how do you extract it? I mean, the Iranians may be arguably six months, a year away from a breakout capacity, probably less in terms of the breakout capacity. They know how to do this. The question is to add time to the clock to keep them X number of years, months away from this breakout capacity. That's the best, in my judgment, you're going to be able to do. I don't see a transformation. I don't see this rule. I don't see a transformational change in the U.S.-Iranian relationship. Too many moving parts, too many conflicts, no political space in Washington at all to give the malocracy in Tehran a very repressive government. 150 people, I understand, have been executed since Rouhani's election as president with a human rights record which is abysmal. So I don't see transformation here. I see, as I've said from the beginning, transaction, which is the best we're going to do for now. Uh, I'm not sure that, hum that human rights is going to get into this, the equation when it comes uh, to Iran, and it doesn't when it comes to any other country. Um, but, but I think I just want to make the point that there's a technical issue here that uh, creates a lot of anxiety, and that is uh, enrichment of uranium uh, at, a very, at the lowest level. Until recently, everyone at, in the P5 plus 1 was in agreement with Israel, with the Gulf states, that there would be no enrichment at all. With these negotiations, what we've seen is that that has, that has changed, that calculation has changed, that now the P5 plus one understands that in order to get a deal, and that because this is a negotiation, Iran will have some enrichment capacity at the end. And I think that is very much the source of, of the, the anxiety. And those anxieties that uh, the Israelis have expressed are equally uh, echoed in the Gulf, for sure. Yeah, if I, if I may, if I could just add one one word to that, I, I think that uh, I think the one thing that uh, Aaron and I could agree on entirely 
is that uh, there is uh, no empirical evidence uh, that the president uh, refrained from striking Syria because he wished to keep his powder dry uh, with respect to Iran or he wanted to avoid complications uh, with, with respect to Iran. And I think uh, as uh, parties such as Israel uh, look, at the, uh, look at the contortions uh, we went through in the, uh, in the Syria case, uh, they're not at all reassured about the president's reassurances concerning Iran. Okay, let me turn to uh, this side of the room, please. Uh, your your uh, question, introduce yourself. Yes, uh, my name is Julia Talib, and uh, I'm, Sir- I'm Syrian. My question is based on several comments you made. If, if uh, the current president uh, uh, refused to step down and if he insists on uh, um, nominating, nominating himself to the, to the 2014 election, what should we expect? Is it a continuation of the civil war, especially that uh, I believe um, in this current conflict it's very difficult for the government nor – like none the government nor the rebel could prevail militarily or even politi- politically. So I was just wondering what should we expect? Anybody would like to take that? Uh, well, I would say first, first with regard to elections, uh, if President Assad elects to uh, stand for re-election and uh, if those elections take place in, uh, in those parts of uh, Syria where he dominates militarily, uh, I would fearlessly uh, predict that uh, he'll win. And uh, he'll win by a, uh, by a fairly substantial margin. Uh, I would expect. Uh, you know, there is, uh, there are, there are some attempts at uh, creative thinking around the whole subject of elections, which, as I understand it, are, are at least on the books, scheduled for May, June, uh, 2014. Uh, I, I suspect the nearer term challenge is uh, Geneva. As uh, one of the one of the architects of the Geneva One Agreement, uh, I'm not at all hostile to the idea of uh, seeing this thing implemented in accordance with the formula that was set down. Uh, I think, realistically, under current circumstances, uh, the chances of success, meaning the creation on the basis of mutual consent of a transitional governing body exercising full executive power in accordance with human rights standards. I think the chances of success are just about nil, uh, barring divine intervention. And I think in the wake of Geneva, I, I would predict the United States will be back to considering the basic policy dilemma. Uh, are we going to somehow reconcile ourselves uh, to the continuation of the Assad regime in some form, or are we going to craft a, tra- a strategy designed to, uh, to affect some changes? Uh, but I don't uh, – I think Geneva may take place on December 12th. I don't, uh, don't hold up much prospect that it's going to succeed, but I, uh, I certainly hope it does. Thank you. I'm afraid I'm going to be able to take only one more question because I want to give our – our panelists, uh, a last minute, uh, uh, the last word, as it were. So, yes, please, could you uh, ask your question? Yes. My name is Suad Mohammed from University of Virginia. You demonstrated different cases to assess decline and coherences of U.S. policy in the Middle East, and you had disagreement among you and even gave a, a, a great or a bad grade for some uh, or by some. My question is what about your assessment for Yemen, and to what degree – is the U.S. policy and the interference that they do there by, number one, sending drones that kill civilians and abolish villages there, and number two, by their immediate interferences in the transitional phase of the local government there. Thank you. I'm glad you asked that question because I think the one area that we didn't really explore was the question of drones. And, uh, of course, as we all know, in Yemen there's a huge popular uh, antipathy toward the use of drones, as there has been in in, uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan. 
and with the, uh, I don't say the vitality, but at least the presence of al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, al-Qaeda in, the, uh, in Syria and Iraq, and al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, uh, I'm wondering, uh, indeed, if any of our panelists you know, have a, a thought about how one should deal with these matters, especially in places that are as politically incoherent as Yemen is at the moment. And I think there's, a, I think there's no answer to that one. <laughs> so, uh, no, I'm going to turn the the question around. I think obviously the drone strikes in Yemen are a political uh, problem, but uh, a military solution. And I think that that is the way that it's viewed in in the U.S. Um, but having said that, I'm actually glad that you mentioned Yemen because Yemen is actually one rare example. Uh, where a transition is working. Now, one has to put this in perspective because it's all relative. Yemen is an extremely poor country. The transition was very, very uh, complicated. But it was, in fact, a region-led transition, which, to my mind, makes it quite interesting. And I think that that is a very fragile transition, and that is an additional reason for the U.S. to be more careful about its drone uh, policy there. It's the only case of the Arab uprisings where the leader transitioned out, actually exactly. remains alive in the country. But it was also the GCC that led the, that led the process. Yes. Uh, I think we've come to the end of the time that was allotted to us. I, I thank uh, Wendy and Kate for giving us a little extra time. And I'd like to thank very much uh, all four of our excellent panelists uh, for, I think, what was a, a, a quite a stimulating uh, discussion. So thank you all very much. <laughs>